In this lesson, we will be discussing sexual harassment, coercion, and violence. Sexual harassment, coercion, and violence can take many different forms. Intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation, blaming, minimizing, or denying one's rights or personal space, using children or pets against one, using privileges, economic abuse, coercion, and other types of threats. What is sexual harassment? The law defines sexual harassment as unwelcome verbal, visual, or physical conduct of a sexual nature that is severe or pervasive and affects working conditions or creates a hostile work environment. Let's first look at what is considered conduct of a sexual nature. Conduct of a sexual nature is broken into three parts, verbal, visual, and physical. We'll first look at verbal conduct of a sexual nature. Verbal conduct of a sexual nature includes comments about clothing, a person's body, sexual or gender-based jokes, remarks requesting sexual favors, repeatedly asking a person out, sexual innuendos, threats, spreading rumors about a person's personal or sexual life, and foul or obscene language. Visual conduct of a sexual nature includes images such as posters, drawings, photos, emails, cartoons, screensavers, texts, and more that display anything of a sexual nature including images that display partial or full nudity, images that include inappropriate or revealing clothing, images that suggest sexually related activities or actions, and jokes or cartoons that are of a sexual nature. Physical conduct of a sexual nature can include sexual assault, impeding or blocking one's movement, sexual gesturing, leering or staring, and inappropriate touching, including kissing, hugging, patting, stroking, or rubbing. There are two categories of sexual harassment. The first is quid pro quo. The second is hostile environment. Let's take a moment to look at these now. Quid pro quo literally means this for that. Here are two examples of quid pro quo. When a person in a position of power promises or gives job rewards such as raises or promotions based on the subordinate's response to sexual advances. Another example of quid pro quo is when a person in a position of power threatens or follows through with punishments such as demotions, loss of a job, or pay cuts based on the subordinate's response to sexual advances. Next, let's look at what is considered a hostile environment. A hostile environment is defined as conduct that unreasonably interferes with work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Here is an example of a hostile environment. Repeated sexual comments that make someone feel so uncomfortable that their work performance suffers or they decline professional opportunities because it will put them in contact with the harasser. In sexual harassment lawsuits, in both categories of sexual harassment, quid pro quo, and hostile environment, the employee must prove that the conduct was offensive. However, employees do not need to prove that they or someone else was the intended victim of the harassment. Let's look at some examples. Example 1. An employee tells a dirty joke to a female coworker. The female coworker thinks it's funny, but a second woman passing by finds it offensive. That joke could contribute to a hostile environment simply because someone finds it offensive. There are two conditions that determine the liability for employers in cases involving hostile environment in sexual harassment lawsuits. First, it must be shown that the employer knew about or should have known about the harassment and failed to take appropriate corrective action. 
Second, it must be shown that the employer failed in having a training program as well as a clear procedure for reporting sexual harassment. What is consent? Sexual assault prevention requires giving and receiving consent to a sexual activity with another or other persons. Affirmative consent is when someone agrees, gives permission, or says yes. Consent is always freely given. All people in a sexual situation must feel that they are able to say yes or no or stop the sexual activity at any point. Consent is a clear and unambiguous agreement expressed outwardly through mutually understandable words or actions to engage in a particular activity. Consent can be withdrawn by either party at any point. Consent must be voluntarily given. Consent to engage in one's sexual activities or a past agreement, consent to engage in one sexual activity or past agreement to engage in a particular sexual activity cannot be presumed to constitute consent to engage in different sexual activity or to engage again in a sexual activity. Consent cannot be validly given by a person who is incapacitated. At the heart of consent, is the idea that every person has a right to personal sovereignty, the right to not be acted upon by someone else in a sexual manner unless they have given that person clear permission. It is the responsibility of the person initiating the sexual activity to get this permission. Consent should never be assumed. Each of us is responsible for making sure we have consent in every sexual situation. If you are unsure, it is important to clarify what your partner feels about the sexual situation before initiating or continuing a sexual activity. Consent should not simply be assumed by body language, appearance, or nonverbal communication. One should never assume that someone wants to have sex with them based solely upon the way a person dresses, smiles, body language, acts, or facial expression. Consent should not simply be assumed by a dating relationship or previous sexual activity. Simply because two or more people are dating or have had sex in the past does not mean that they are consenting to have sex in the future. Even in marriage, a person should not assume that they have consent for sexual activity. Marital rape is as serious as any other sexual assault. Consent to engage in one sexual activity at one time is not consent to engage in a different sexual activity or to engage in the same sexual activity on a later occasion. Consent should not simply be assumed by silence, passivity, lack of resistance, or immobility. A person's silence should not be considered consent. A person who does not respond to attempts to engage in sexual activity, even if they do not verbally say no or resist physically, is not clearly agreeing to sexual activity. Consent should not be simply assumed by incapacitation. Alcohol consumption or use of other drugs can render a person incapable of giving consent. Alcohol is often used as a weapon to target individuals and is used by perpetrators to excuse their own actions. Additionally, Michigan criminal sexual conduct laws apply to a perpetrator regardless of whether or not they were drinking. It is important to remember that sexual assault is never the survivor's fault, regardless of whether they intended or not to get intoxicated. Why is consent so important? As we work towards a world free of sexual assault, intimate partner violence, stalking, and sexual harassment, It is important to promote equality and respect for all members of our community through our commitment to primary prevention. Thank you for watching.